good evening uh, ladies and gentlemen and uh, good morning to professor uh, paul raj who has uh, joined this program from uh, california uh, 2022 is a very important year uh, for india international center this happens to be the diamond jubilee year for us uh, to commemorate uh, this uh, event uh, we have drawn out an year long program a lot of preparation has been done for that our president sri anand bora constituted an organizing committee to deliberate over the subject and uh, recommend the kind of programs to be you know held the organizing committee in turn identified six important subject and uh, formed six cluster groups one for each subject these cluster groups have recommended various programs Uh, one cluster group is on the digital governance of which convener is mr sham saran our uh, life trustee uh, his cluster group has identified and recommended uh, very important programs and the first one such program is going to be held uh, today that is a talk by renowned professor arokya swami paul raj he would be speaking to us on the artificial intelligence i extend a very special welcome to our eminent guest speaker professor paul raj he is professor emeritus in the department of electrical engineering stanford university usa who has taken time out from his extremely busy schedule to be with us this evening professor paul raj we are extremely honored to have you with us today i also extend a very warm welcome to our president sri anand bora who has accepted our invitation and has kindly agreed to chair today's program he is the one who has been guiding us at every step in uh, holding the diamond jubilee programs i would be failing in my duty in acknowledging uh, the contribution made by sri sham saran our life trustee the convener of digital uh, governance group he is the one who has been instrumental for Uh, organizing uh, this program today i extend a very warm welcome to you sir i extend a warm welcome to all of you ladies and gentlemen who have joined uh, this program uh before uh, i hand over the floor to our president sri anand bora to conduct the uh, further proceedings i consider it my you know privileged duty to uh, introduce dr paul raj to all of you dr paul raj is a very fa- you know familiar name in india and abroad so he hardly needs any introduction nevertheless briefly i'll introduce him to all of you professor paul raj is an internationally acknowledged expert on artificial intelligence and uh, digital networks he had been a most accomplished scientist whose pioneering research on naval sonars was a huge contribution to the indian navy he has continued his research into the most advanced technologies at stanford university in us and has won international acclaim he has been a key advisor to the indian government both on the promotion and regulation of artificial intelligence which is a most powerful tool to help resolve many intractable problems facing humanity but also generates unprecedented risks and dangers that is inherent in that very power professor paul raj was the valedictory speaker at the conclusion of iic series metamorphosis a couple of years ago and his presentation on the implications of advances in digital technology made a deep, deep impression he has the ability to convey complex ideas and concepts in terms that are intelligible to ordinary people we all use devices that use complex sophisticated technologies but rarely do we understand how these devices work the gap between scientific advances and popular understanding of what lies behind them is becoming wider this gap needs to be bridged and isc has been contributing to that effort artificial intelligence has been defined as the ability of a digital computer or computer controlled robo to perform task commonly associated with intelligent beings 
Computers are now programmed to carry out increasingly complex tasks with great proficiency. This proficiency is based on the ability to analyze very large data sets with incredible speed. The analysis of data reveals patterns, the study of which generates knowledge and knowledge creates value. This is how AI works. It is able to sift from an almost infinite number of permutations and combinations to deliver optimum outcomes, something beyond human capacity. We are familiar with how Russian Grandmaster Gary Kasparov was beaten at chess by IBM's Deep Blue computer program. But less than 10 years later, in 2016, Google's AlphaGo artificial intelligence program was able to triumph over Lee Shadol, the world champion of Chinese board game, Go, which an even more complex board game than chess. Artificial intelligence and the associate domain of digital technology can enable developing countries like India to leapfrog into the future. However, like any technology, it creates benefits, but also carries risks. The challenge lies in harnessing it to the humanity's benefit while minimizing the dangers that are inherent in, in its power. There is no better person than Professor Paul Raj who can help decode what has become an historic subject for most of us. Uh, I close here. I once again welcome each one of you to this program. I now hand over the floor to our President Sri Anil Bora to conduct the further, further proceedings. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Kalash. Good evening to you, all the participants, and good morning to Professor Paul Raj, our distinguished guest speaker this evening. Our director has uh, has spoken at some length about the subject that Professor Paul Raj is going to speak about, as also about Professor Paul Raj's great eminence in our country and to the country to which he shifted some years back. Before I say anything else, I would briefly repeat uh, what uh, our director has just said, that we are uh, this year, Professor Paul Raj, celebrating the 60th year of our birth as an institution. And as it happens, uh, alongside, we are also celebrating the 75th year of our independence. And uh, um, not unknown to any of us, we have a galaxy of uh, challenges facing our country and our population of 135 crores. So our colleagues in the Board of Trustees in the International, in the International Center, uh, we had sat together and it was um, unanimously agreed that we should conceive of plan series of uh, lectures by eminent persons, eminent experts, intellectuals, uh, focusing on some of the identified major challenges which face our country in different arena. So as, as Kalash just mentioned, we have uh, several groups of our trustees led by our trustees and other intellectuals with some of the important and uh, well-known experts and specialists in the different areas who are looking at uh, issues of democracy, governance, public health, education, climate change, arts, culture, and so on. And one of these areas on which we are focusing, Professor Paul Raj, is uh, because of your past relations with us and our confidence in bothering you time and again, is digital governance. And as mentioned, my uh, colleague, uh, Ambassador Sham Saran, is leading this uh, uh, cluster group. And they have identified various uh, issues, themes, subjects on which we are requesting well-known personalities of your stature to come and speak to us. We very much hope that uh, uh, this effort will, uh, in the course of time, uh, at least have one consequence 
that is of enlarging awareness, enlarging uh, the horizons of our understanding of certain issues which appear very, very uh, um, exclusive. Uh, for the sake of uh, informing uh, all the participants this evening, I would like to mention that a few years ago, in the 18 and uh, 1819, uh, we had organized a series of lectures under the title Metamorphosis. And uh, these were uh, basically on the frontiers of science and technology and what advancements had been made and how these were helping or not helping uh, the uh, enormous, the huge population of our world, particularly the countries with a uh, uh, large amount of poverty. And uh, the valedictory address of this series, Metamorphosis, was delivered uh, by no else than Professor Paul Raj at our request. Uh, he had accepted Shamsaran's personal request to, to uh, talk to us. And it was a most wonderful lecture. I missed hearing it, but then later on, I, I heard the recorded version of this talk. Now, uh, uh, I don't need to say uh, very much in regard to science and technology, artificial intelligence, robotics, digital technologies and networks, because our director had uh, said some words of this. But I would uh, only say that uh, um, the first of all, uh, an understanding amongst the people at large, the society at large, of what these advances are. And... Uh, side by side correspondingly, uh, reasonably sufficient to adequate awareness of what are the implications of uh, these enormous advantages that we are seeking, the advances that we have in science and technology, and what are the possible consequences which may not be entirely happy. I wouldn't use the word adverse, but some of the consequences uh, could uh, um, uh, be inherent of dangers, risks, which are perhaps possibly not adequately perceived in the society at large or even amongst the intelligentsia, if I may say so. Um, not to repeat again what Kalash has mentioned, I would, uh, I would still like to mention that uh, before Professor Paul Raj left uh, the shores of our country, he had done enormous work to lay the uh, intellectual as well as the scientific architecture of, of uh, advancing uh, the digital technologies and artificial intelligence and so on. And these institutions with which he was associated or which he helped to create and establish uh, the faculties and experts and researchers, they are, the, their work is now, Professor Paul Raj, bearing fruit, as you would know, much, much better than me because you are in touch with your fellow scientists, uh, which, we, the, which opportunity we don't get every day. Now, these uh, advancements which I just mentioned, uh, particularly in the arena of uh, digital technologies and AI, um, they, they, they have uh, inherent potential risks in terms of misuse or misapplication and not being for the use for the larger benefit of the larger segments of our society. Uh, therefore, all the more reason that we, we uh, look forward, Professor Paul Wright, to hearing you uh, how the uh, fast increasing gap, the chasm, if I may use the word, between uh, an understanding of the uh, scientific and technological aspects of these advances and uh, uh, better understanding of the potential risks and hazards involved in, in not uh, being adequately watchful of uh, the direction in which we proceed in terms of application, in terms of, of uh, uh, use and abuse. And in this context, I would also like to mention that uh, Mr. Paul Raj had uh, uh, before going, and even now, he's in constant touch with the, our scientific community, also laid down the broad parameters of uh, regulation. It's not merely promotion of these technologies, but also how, what steps we need to take or keep in mind 
internal regulation. So I would not take more time. We already 15 minutes have passed. Uh, Professor Paul Raj is going to speak to us on AI, artificial intelligence, society, and governance. So Professor Paul Raj, I request you to please take the floor. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Vora. Uh, Mr. Vora, uh, President, India International Center, Ambassador Sham Saran, Life Trustee, Mr. Sivastav, Director, and ladies and gentlemen. My thanks to Mr. Vora for his very kind words. It's indeed a high privilege and a great honor to speak at the Diamond Jubilee Lecture Series of the Center. My gratitude to Ambassador Saran for inviting me. Also, my thanks to all of you for joining this event today. I, was, I wish I was in Delhi today, but COVID intervened and I'm speaking to you from my home at Stanford University campus in California. The India International Center is the foremost institution in India for informed public discourse on subjects of vital interest to our country. The true, true jewel of India that was founded with the efforts of President Radhakrishnan, Prime Minister Nehru, and many luminaries of newly independent India. Every Indian can be proud of the service the center has rendered to our country. And my congratulations to the eminent leadership that over the decades has led the center. The subject of my remarks today, this evening, is on AI, society, and governance. I have to admit that I primarily work in wireless technology, and AI is only in the periphery of my interests. Uh, but uh, I'm, so I'm, even in AI, I'm more involved with code technology. I'll, sp I'll define that later. And not so much on the societal impact. But here at Stanford, we have a major effort. It's called AI, human-centered AI, uh, studying these particular issues of society and governance. And sometimes uh, I'm involved with that center. So I'll try and translate what I learned here. So when Mr. Ambassador Sham Saran asked me to speak this evening, uh, I agreed to do so out of my great respect for him. Uh, uh, and, uh, but do, do be aware that, uh, that uh, I'm not an expert on society and governance issues. Uh, and, uh, and perhaps many of you know a lot more about AI than I do, but I hope I can add some, you know, some additional perspectives today. So with that, let me start. I share my screen. Mr. Sivastav, is it visible, my screen? Yes, yes, sir, Professor, okay. very clearly. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so that's my topic. So let's start with saying, what is, uh, what is AI? But very simply, it's, uh, it's computers doing things that are considered to require intelligence when humans do them. Understanding natural language, recognizing faces, uh, driving automobiles, and, uh, sorry, uh, automobiles, and, uh, uh, and guessing what other movies we might, uh, we might want to see based on what we have previously enjoyed watching. So it's a difference between mechanical arm on a factory production line, programmed to repeat the same basic task again and again, and an arm that learns through trial and error how to handle different tasks by itself. So that's a, a short, uh, succinct definition of AI. So, what about the common applications of AI? I think many of these things are now worldwide, and some of them also in India. Let me run through a few. On the top left, we have uh, all the social media, which uh, some of you use, uh, which of course I don't, but uh, it's very much a fact that all our youth particularly use it. Uh, and then of course, this use of AI in banking, for example, like uh, loan approval, 
uh, uh, certainly today, I think it's also come to India, where it can be pretty successful in improving, uh, you know, uh, behavior of uh, uh, of the, the of the credit system. Uh, third one, for example, is the reading of radiology reports, MRI, and CAT scans, where AI actually has exceeded human capabilities. I think today AI outperforms uh, radiology performance, and uh, other one is, for example, text translation. You could look at a text with your iPhone at, uh, uh, at another language, and then you would see it in language that you prefer to. Uh, or real-time voice translation, seamless voice translation. You speak in Gujarati, another one may be Hindi. And this is a, these two have enormous implications for India because it allows our non-speaking, non-English speaking community, which is large, to, to connect with the, the this English speaking world where much of the commerce and science and, uh, and uh, uh, knowledge lies. And then AI could be used in uh, surveillance, for example, looking at traffic and understanding traffic patterns, use of AI in credit card fraud. So today I'm sure it's heavily used in India uh, use of AI in uh, factory automation. And the last one where I'm now look at a little more closely is use of AI in driving where ca cameras or, or radars in cars can look forward, segment images and classify them as cars and pedestrians and help both the safety of the, uh, of the road users and also your own safety. So these are there are thousands and thousands of applications of AI. It's all coming or happening now, many in India. So this is a big revolution. So, uh, so some of the AI typical areas for AI um, um, is uh, starts with the health, major area, governance, agriculture, e-commerce, uh, finance, law, education, social media, transportation, manufacturing. Uh, some of the, what I tick mark here, I think is already getting into India in a big way. Law, for example, I'm not sure, but in the United States, we use AI for setting your bail amount and also for even deciding whether you should be paroled. And of course, uh, things like that get, get controversial because of issue, issues of bias, and I'll talk about that later. But uh, AI is already, is already there everywhere, coming into India, uh, absolutely inevitably and is going to transform our lives. So the next part of uh, what I want to talk about is AI technologies. So, so typically these were the basic understanding of how, to, how do you build machines to behave, to do intelligent things. And, uh, and some of the technologies are things like machine learning and I'll explain that more, how a machine can learn uh, to recognize objects, to uh, do complicated uh, actions, that's machine learning. Another one is neural networks. And neural networks is, uh, is, uh, uh, a, is a subset of machine learning where you use, uh, it's actually the most popular part of AI, where you can, uh, you have a, architecture of computing, which somewhat uh, uh, imitates the, how the human brain might work. We really don't understand human intelligence, but these neural networks have been doing a good job. And I'll talk, I'll give some examples of that. Another one is machine vision, where essentially a computer, a machine can look at it, look at a, a piece of uh, 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 image or, a, or a, even a video and start saying, doing intelligent things with that. And of course, natural language processing, where you can a machine can look at text or a spoken language and begin to understand what it's saying. And, uh, and already some of this is happening today when we interact with uh, robots uh, uh, on, on our phones. So there's a much going, lot going on in AI. And uh, all, all that AI does finally depends on core technology. The core technology includes the mathematics and algorithms and understanding, and a lot of it is statistics. In fact, one can always call machine learning as statistical learning. And this stuff is extremely important, quite complex. But to translate this understanding into real ap applications, we need semiconductors. 
and semiconductors uh, is, uh, is a big frontier of AI and uh, uh, you know, some of the biggest chips today are in AI. There are chips today which have, uh, and like you know, the neuron is something like 2.7 trillion neurons, unbelievable complexity and billions, of, I would say tens of billions of dollars are going in developing these chips. Because once you have the chips, then you got to put together AI machines or data centers, we have AI servers, and these could of course be large systems using megawatts of power. And, uh, and of course, you can also have small AI chips, for example, your phone actually has AI chips today to deal with uh, smaller functions like image recognition for ID, face ID, and so on and so forth but complex AI gets done in these servers. Uh, so this is the core technology area. These are very difficult to enter, very high bar. I'll talk a little bit about that later. So let me talk a little bit about uh, some of the history of AI. I think it, uh, the idea of using computers to behave like human beings or in some form was uh, pioneered by uh, Alan Turing uh, you know, uh, one of the founders of computer science. And some of you may know that Alan's parents uh, were civil servants in India. And uh, Alan was educated in England, but he used to come home for summers. And is, uh, actually their family home is now owned by uh, Nandan Nilekeni in Kunnaur. Uh, so uh, then uh, in the 60s, uh, people began to talk about AI and John McCarthy, uh, over here, I actually uh, coined the word AI. Uh, there was a famous conference at Dartmouth. And uh, so he's, a, uh, he's not no more, but, but uh, I did meet him before he passed away at Stanford. So he's a very, one of the big pioneers of AI and, uh, and launched it. Another familiar face to all of us is Raj Reddy, a professor at Carnegie Mellon. But Raj did his postdoctoral work in, in, machine, in voice recognition at Stanford and did some very good work. He's seen as a pioneer of voice recognition. And uh, then he moved on to Carnegie Mellon and he's been a visionary for AI for many years. And uh, very recently we had a big function here in California to come to honor his many contributions. Another one is uh, Professor Ed Feigenbaum, a neighbor of mine. He's uh, another professor at Stanford uh, well known for you know, for pioneering expert systems, a paradigm that was popular some years ago. Uh, <clears throat> and this, uh, there were ups and downs in AI, so uh, a lot of promises, but sometimes uh, uh, disappointments. But this went on for some time, and uh, in fact, I was visiting Stanford in the 80s, and uh, uh, I was I always worked in signal processing, but I was was familiar with uh, AI ideas. When I came back, uh, uh, the, uh, the government asked me to start this AI lab in Bangalore. So that's how I got started, but I didn't stay very long. I was asked to, uh, uh, to run uh, 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 issues of uh, uh, avionics and weapons for the LCA pro Tejas program. So I, I moved into that, but uh, eventually I, I came back to Stanford. But uh, the big breakthrough came around 2005 or six when uh, Firstly, because computing, uh, memory, and data, thanks to the internet, all became available in a huge scale. Computing now had advanced enormously from its early days in the 70s, and, uh, and certainly memory was, had become enormously cheap and certain data. And, uh, uh, and there were some new names associated with this new wave, and then things began to take off. And I should mention Jeff Hinton, University of Toronto, uh, Bengio, I've not put his name up here, and Jan Lacun at New York, New York University. So they all came up with different ideas of neural networks and sometimes broadly classes, deep neural networks. The word deep probably is a bit of a misnomer. I'll explain what it means. But that uh, began to transform AI. And the Professor Fifi Lee at Stanford, a colleague, she actually also played a big role in organizing data which is of course all these AI systems require data. So she pioneered some of that. So it's uh, Hinton, Bengio, Lacun, uh, Jan Lacun and uh, Professor Lee uh, led this evolution when AI began to do some really important things. 
and we began to see useful, useful applications. The last person here is Helmut Bolskai, a professor at uh, ETH in Zurich, uh, one of Europe's top universities. So he, uh, uh, and I'll explain this later about his contributions. It turns out where AI has begun to work and, uh, and quite often, uh, quite usefully, uh, underlying uh, theoretical understanding of why it works, how well it works, is not well understood. So Professor Bolskai is a global pioneer in that area. Stanford. So uh, in order to give, uh, many of you know this stuff, but I'm going to give a little uh, layman's approach to what is, how does AI function? function. So let me talk about a toy example uh, of uh, AI. So let's assume, for example, you have, a, you have a, a gauge which measures temperature and humidity, it's on your porch, and you make some measurements uh, of these two figures and plot them on a 2D graph. And you note whether it was a winter measurement or it's a summer measurement. So winter is a triangle, summer is a star. We have a bunch of measurements. So there are about 16 measurements here. We call it 16 training samples. Now, it doesn't take too much uh, for you to realize that you could actually kind of plot a line by hand or a computer can do that for you. It's sometimes called support vector machines by which you can divide what, what was likely to be, what was the winter measurements from summer measurements. So at this point, we have done some, we learned that, you know, measurements are formed into different clusters and they can be kind of separated. So this is the learning part of AI. Then suppose you're given a new data point uh, of temperature and humidity, but you, you quite forgot whether it was winter or summer. Well, you plot it. And now if you see that it's lying to the left of this boundary, it must be, you're likely to assume or infer that it is, it, it was probably in winter. So that's an inference. So you do training, you bring info. So this is a very toy example of recognizing patterns and using it. Now, it turns out that uh, real AI uh, does the same thing, but instead of two dimensions, the number of dimensions involved are 10,000, 100,000 dimensions. And uh, a lot of real world problems uh, live in those very high level of dimensions. Human, we can't uh, in a, visualize that by any means, but computers can do it. So much of AI works by learning patterns and data, but at very, very high level of dimensions. And uh, I mean, do any, uh, and, uh, and then it starts doing very interesting things. So to give you a more feel for this, uh, let's uh, take this uh, kind of common problem of uh, AI classification of, say, cats versus dogs. It's, a, uh, again, a toy problem, but it's a pretty interesting problem for AI solves and quite amazing, too. So if you have, say, a bunch of images of cats and dogs, uh, you could actually uh, uh, convert these images into very large dimensional vec vectors, very large dimensions, say, 10,000 plus dimensions. I wouldn't go, don't go in how, we, how it's done. And you need a lot of training samples, say 50,000, 100,000 samples of cats and dogs. And of course they're labeled, this is a dog, that's a cat and so on and so forth. And when you sort of take these into this, uh, look at these in high dimensions, you tend to use what's called a neural network. A neural network uh, contains uh, neurons and weights and it propagates from layer to layer, the so input neurons and output neurons. In this case, what you do is you take the label data and give it, offer it to this network, and then you tell the network that this is the cat. Next time you might give a dog, is this is the dog, but give tens of th hundreds of thousands of these. And this uh, neural network is then uses some learning and it discovers that there are patterns in very high dimensional space where cats seem to lie on the blue thing and the dog seem to lie on this one, on another cluster. And it turns out all the mathematics of doing that is fairly straightforward. It's mostly linear uh, uh, tensor algebra, which uh, many of you uh, would know about. So, so the word called deep neural network, uh, deep learning is only because we have multiple layers. And that was the, the, the understanding that uh, Professor Hinton and Professor Bengio brought to this field by, by showing that uh, deep uh, multiple layers help today. Uh, the number of layers in network can go up to tens of thousands of layers. 
and these input dimensions can go to 100,000 dimensions. So these things get really, really, really big, but uh, this is called deep learning. It turns out that the idea of this kind of adaptation is sometimes in signal processing where I work is called adaptive filtering. Mr. Wora mentioned about uh, some work I did in Sonar almost 45 years ago in India, and we use such, uh, um, such systems in that sonar, except uh, there's only one layer and there were probably about 100 neurons, but now we're talking about trillions and trillions of neurons. At that point, we start, these machines behave, began to behave intelligently. Now, how do you actually therefore use the machine? Once you train the network, and the training means there are some weights, mathematical numbers sitting here, and these, this, this is a model now, and that model has captured the fact that cats sit on this and dogs sit on, on these at very high dimensions. And then suppose you're given a, a new image here, and then you refer to, and, and you want to decide whether it's a cat or a dog. We give it to this new neural network. It goes and maps it to this clusters and find it's actually points to sitting in this cluster if I say it's a cat. So that's the inferencing. So you do a training earlier, and then this is the inferencing. So a lot of AI does this sort of things, but it does this on images, on videos, on spoken language understanding. Uh, and so, but uh, the thing is that the underlying math looks simple. Uh, the, the understanding of how it works is very, very complex. We don't fully understand it fully, but it is very miraculous. And a lot of things that we call intelligence can be done by these machines, just the very complex machines. So it turns out AI, of course, needs data, tons and tons of data. If you have neurons, like a, you have a one, uh, one trillion neurons, you need trillions of bytes of data in order to drain those neurons. So the AI models get larger, billions, now trillions, we need a lot more data. Of course, the challenge is to collect such data, to verify the data is, uh, is, you know, is integral, and you also, also have to protect the data because privacy is involved in, in this faces. So a big name there is, uh, is, uh, is uh, Fifi Lee, as a colleague here at Stanford. She also now directs the human-centered AI center at Stanford. Okay, so that is a little bit about technology AI, and I hope you have some idea how these things work. At one level, almost straightforward, and it's really the miracle of large computing ability and, uh, and uh, plenty of data, which is the real miracle here. But, uh, but there are lots of understanding issues too. So, so, so AI is still pretty fragile, and, uh, and here are some examples of the problem. Suppose here is a panda, uh, we all recognize it, and uh, we can actually build a, a a distortion pattern, it's sort of derived from that, from the image, we, the panda image, add them together, and this is the new image. If any of us, even a child will say that's a panda. But these AI machines can often be completely thrown off the, uh, thrown off the rails, and they'll call this a dog or maybe a motor car. So it can become very fragile. And why is it so fragile? Uh, it's not, you know, needs much more understanding so that's one area that, that we, we are studying now. It works most of the time. For example, image classification of say, of animals or, or, or on, uh, of looking at objects in a road from a camera works 98%, 97%, but, uh, but, but it is fragile and uh, needs more work. Another example of AI's issues is uh, the issue of training. Uh, take the young child here, if it showed say two or three dogs, and uh, maybe two or three cats. After that, uh, you show any dog of any breed or cat of any breed, the child will say it's a cat or a dog. But for an AI machine, which uses megawatts of power, you got to show 50,000, 100,000 cats, 100,000 dogs before it gets anywhere near uh, what a child can do. So obviously uh, the framework is successful, but uh, now we have uh, human beings are far more superior. But of course, these machines have many other advantages over us, and I'll talk about that. And of course, there's also data. We have tons of data needed, and we have to make sure data's, data integrity, completeness, accuracy is not biased, 
uh, player not, if data is not right, the training is not going to be right, and the machines are not going to do what they're supposed to do. A person who's really looking at the foundation of these things is Professor Polsky in, in, in Zurich, uh, a, a close colleague and formerly a student of mine. So uh, we're talking about why does AI become of particular relevance uh, is that uh, it's scale. You take human beings, uh, over a lifetime, we probably see a million faces. We probably, uh, uh, for at least people younger than me, remember about 3,000 of them. Machines, uh, over a day, can see a billion or two billion faces, and they're seeing it because the cameras all over the world, and they remember every one of them. And it, nothing to, it's easy for a machine, but uh, so here's an example where AI can out, uh, certainly uh, you know, outperform human beings. So a little bit about the fun facts about our brain and, and, uh, and uh, AI. Uh, our brain is about three pounds. Uh, machines are still, you know, high-performing AI engines are still very large, and maybe 300,000 pounds. Uh, chips are getting smaller and more powerful, but they're still, you use, and you, it's, uh, it's still much, much bigger than, than human beings. Volume 85 cubic inches, these are much larger, they entire, occupy entire you know, factory flows uh, or data centers. We probably use about 20 watts and of course our, our brains use a lot of power, but these things use much more watts, uh, five megawatts, uh, six megawatts. But machines have almost infinite memory. They never forget. They can collaborate with thousands of other machines. They can collect vast data from internet, databases, diverse sensors. So these things have begun to do lots of interesting things. So, so, so now we come to the questions about uh, uh, the uh, uh, ethics of AI, because AI now has begun to touch so many parts of our life. It's part of our li life, and we have to make sure that, uh, that this technology is, behaves ethically. So the issues about fairness, AI should be should be uh, you know, free of uh, should it. Uh, uh, should be free of and address potential discrimination and bias, because uh, and there's a lot of complaints in the United States that these these AI engines are unfair, because quite often the data that's provided to them comes from historical records, and as you know, both in the United States and also in India and all over the world, there's lots of biases in society, and that gets captured, it gets perpetuated. So fairness is a very important part. And how do you make sure that these engines uh, are fair uh, remains both an ethical and a technological problem. Also secure, the, the algorithms, the models that it learns and the data itself should be safe from outside interference. And uh, we, all, we all know uh, that these things can happen. Of course, a lot of data is, is, uh, is private data. So, Security is also a major part of the problem. So there's lots of new mathematics to try and keep algorithms and models and the post data encrypted. There's never, yet AI can do its job, but it's never unencrypted. Also, it should be explainable because when AI makes decisions like deciding whether we should get a loan or not, there should be some transparency how it works. So the logic of and the decisions produced by AI should be communicated to stakeholders clearly and be visible to all of us. And certainly accountable organizations and individuals uh, should be accountable for outcomes of AI systems they develop and implement. So this is an area which, of research all over the world, and I'm sure we in India are looking at it also. At Stanford, we have a center called Human-Centered AI, which uh, Professor Fifi Lee runs. And uh, so, uh, so as AI gets more and more powerful, these become very fundamental uh, of fundamental importance. So now I'm getting closer to uh, issues of society and governance. So if you go back to, uh, so AI is really the fourth of the industrial revolutions. Uh, the first was mechanical production, railroads, and um, uh, 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 steam power. And then came the second revolution of mass production, electrical power, advent of the assembly line, 
uh, certainly in this area. Uh, uh, the first revolution was led by Britain. Uh, the second was led by United States. And the third uh, was use of uh, computers, uh, electronics, and automated production. And this is, we're still kind of living in that era. And we're now slowly moving into the era, the fourth revolution of artificial intelligence, big data, robotics, and more to come. So AI is a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, we work, and relate to one another. In its scale, in its scope and complexity, the transformation will be unlike anything humankind has experienced before. So it has huge potential for the positive, but it also has many, many dangers. So let's look at some of the possible economic benefits of AI. And one, uh, at this point, uh, I think this is universal and uh, almost all the concerns about AI in the United States also apply to India and vice versa, but India, uh, uh, because of our e economic uh, strength, have uh, uh, different kinds of problems. One is labor productivity. So because AI can augment human performance, uh, it can augment, augment how, 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 how much productive labor is. So today, for example, uh, all of us use Amazon. So in Amazon, you know, warehouses, uh, a lot of AI is used. Now, still, we need human beings, but with, thanks to AI, uh, one human being can do the job of maybe 50 human beings because AI is helping it, getting it done. So that's a big factor. And of course, uh, all this translates to GDP growth. In the Western world, where typically we only, we only grow about 2 or 3%, or say in the United States, uh, right now it's different, but normally, it may add, they say, about maybe 0.5% to GDP growth, which is enormous. Um, two to two and a half percent makes huge differences. So this has not yet come, but uh, it's expected that will happen. Another important thing is the diffusion of innovation and knowledge. After all, as we saw before, uh, how AI works by, by learning patterns, which is really learning knowledge of various forms. And once it learns that model, it can move it all around the world and uh, a system for bank loans uh, used in the United States can be brought to India. Uh, and these are very complex models, but some modifications will be used in India. So, so diffusion of knowledge and innovation. So there's going to be many, many economic benefits. Uh, and uh, we're only seeing the, only see the whole benefits very dimly, but I think many more to come. And a lot of social benefits like better healthcare, delivery of healthcare and education. Uh, you know, in India, for example, we don't have enough, uh, certainly in urban centers, not enough experienced doctors in urban, uh, in rural, no doctors at all, uh, and vice versa to in education too. And AI can really help uh, uh, do some triaging and uh, help out uh, limit, limited resources to do a better job. So that's particularly India can benefit from healthcare and education, increase labor participation, uh, you know, this is a huge problem for us in India. Only about a third of our population, of our working age population, is actually has gainful employment, or 37%, 38%. So, uh, and part of the problem is skills. So enabling low-skilled workers do jobs that normally require much higher skills. Here in the United States, I've seen examples of companies that I, I involve, work with, where in the U.S. Air Force, workmen with two years of training using with the AI and uh, an augmented reality, for example, like maintenance of jet engines, can work at a, le at, a le at a level of five years of training. So AI can be quite useful there. And also automate hazardous and routine jobs. So certainly uh, automation of jobs uh, uh, is always problematic because jobs is fundamental to human sense uh, and, uh, and also a problem for India but certainly hazardous jobs uh, is best that done by machines. So AI has many, many benefits. I'm just a small list here, but there's many, many more, much more. But uh, it also comes with massive uh, problems too, uh, job displacement. So you're going to lose jobs at lower skill levels and gain them at higher skill levels. So displace jobs from lower to higher skills. And of course, this always happened in every 
Industrial Revolution this happened. I'll talk a little bit more, more uh, soon. Uh, but at rates which is hard for society to, to adjust. Uh, the other revolutions took many years to coming in, coming to coming to coming to force. I think the first industrial revolution probably took 50, 60 years before its full impact was felt. Uh, and the second one was a little faster. But AI, it's going to happen much faster, and we may not be able to adjust to it. So there was going to be lots of uh, losers in this thing. In the United States, I think we expect 47% of our jobs to be so threatened. So it's a great concern as to uh, job displacement. But also, I think, uh, i explain later, uh, there's reasons for hope. Another one which is uh, unique to AI as the Industrial Revolution is concentration of power in governments and in corporations. As they get vast amount of data, only they can, you know, they have the uh, ability to get that uh, through surveillance and other means, and then derive these models, and we as normal citizens don't have access to these. So they have vast asymmetry of, 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 uh, uh, of power, which is never good for a democracy. And, uh, and of course, increased inequality. Rich are going to get richer, and the poor, unfortunately, are going to get poorer. It's uh, between countries, uh, between companies, and between people. So, this is a, uh, so these are the risks, and of course, we have to, and I think we have uh, civil society fight these risks, and I think it's possible, but never easy. And uh, use of disinformation for mass population manipulation for political purposes and polarization we're seeing it happening all over the world. It's absolutely frightening. It's burnt down countries. And, uh, and uh, this is probably the most uh, insidious aspect of AI and uh, uh, needs a lot of attention. And social media platforms, they use AI to increase drive up engagement. They want more and more eyeballs. And some of the way they're doing it where for human beings to spread fake news, try attention. They're trying to make more money, but that also polarizes people. And in fact, I think the genocide that happened uh, in, in uh, Myanmar, uh, uh, many, many Muslims were killed, was largely driven up by social media. So it's a huge tragedy. So, you know, so AI comes with all these enormous risks. But talking about jobs, which I think is central, central to India, is the question of job displacement. So it's good to understand, for example, the textile industry. Uh, we go back 300 years, you know, cloth spinning and weaving was a family affair. Right? Uh, it was done by the husband and wife and children also helped out. And, uh, but then automation came in and uh, what was a low skilled jobs and there was not many high skills was replaced by, by a lot of high skilled jobs and, and uh, the low skilled jobs of course disappeared. So, this transformation uh, is important. So I'll say a few words about that transformation. The, uh, so throughout history of industrial revolutions, uh, uh, job loss uh, has turned out to be sometimes the worry about it turned out to be too pessimistic. For example, in the textile industry, more and more tasks in the weaving process were automated, prompting workers to focus on things that machines can do, such as designing and building machines, tending machines, keep them running. This caused an output to grow explosively. In America, in the 19th century, the amount of coarse cloth a single weaver could produce in one hour increased by 50 times. And the amount of labor required per yard of cloth fell by 98%. That made cloth cheaper, increased demand for it, which in turn created much more jobs for weaving and ancillary industries. And their numbers quadrupled between 1830 to 1900. In other words, technology gradually changed the weaver's job and the skills required to do it. And certainly, and rather than eliminating jobs altogether, of course, some workers who couldn't upskill, of course, did, did, did suffer. But uh, by and large, the world was a much better place. The key, to, key issue to note is that lower skilled jobs that disappeared were replaced by even more but higher skilled jobs. The story repeated, was repeated in the telephone industry and in many other, in automotive industry and so on and so forth. But there's increasing worry 
that the AI the story might be different, certainly different in developing countries like India. So, uh, and certainly we, we actually saw some of these problems because in India, when textile industry was industrialized uh, uh, in the, and the UK and UK transformed, our handloom industry was largely destroyed and sort of deindustrialized our society. So uh, we did not have the technology or education base of Britain. So we're not able to replace the lost jobs uh, with higher skilled ones. And therefore, uh, 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 AI and job displacement is an issue, uh, but I think uh, uh, it requires a lot of engagement with society. And I think I think we will win and come out on top. So uh, let me uh, just a little discussion about what job might displace when. I'll skip it. So uh, so how do we protect? Uh, 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 AI, uh, uh, so how to protect the society from risks of AI. So AI has many, many positives, uh, and of course some negatives, but the fact is it is coming. Banning AI is like a kind of banning smartphones and internet and commercial jets and MRI machines, not possible. It's going to come. So we have to find ways of dealing with these downsides. Certainly, we need to strengthen research capability in India to understand the benefits and risks of AI, so that uh, particularly to protect our vulnerable population. We also need a broader public understanding and debate on AI. We've got to get as many people involved as possible because these are not simple things and we need to understand, and there are diverse viewpoints that we've got to take into account. And with that, we have to craft informed industrial and labor policies by the government. And in my opinion, also create watchdog institutions, apolitical and independent non-government so that uh, uh, powers that be of corporations and governments uh, uh, do not use or uh, misuse AI. And ultimately, I'm sure we all agree that a democratic, inclusive, open, pluralistic societal framework that we got through our constitution really is our best defense against, uh, uh, defend, defense against make, mitigating the problem that AI may have. So yeah, a few remarks about India and um, the, uh, so India is now 75, there was a celebration here in San Francisco where I spoke. So we have seen enormous gains. Uh, compared to the years of pre-independent India. Our GDP has grown, the first 30, 40 years was we grew at uh, 3% or 4%, but last 30 years closer to 7%. Of recently we have suffered, but I'm sure we will come back. We've built a huge middle class. So we have built a lot of digital infrastructure, thanks to Nandan Nilekeni and UID and Aadhaar. And the industry, also has done well, our IT service industry is known all over the world. We have an auto industry, the fifth largest in the world. We have generic pharma industry. Uh, we are, I think, like 35, 40% of generic drugs are produced in India. We have FinTech, so a lot to be proud of. But of course, many, many challenges remain. And I think Mr. Vora mentioned that. I mean, poverty is a huge issue for our country. and. Uh, uh, jobs and labor participation uh, remains uh, remains an area to be much to be improved. Our skilling levels are are low. Our credit markets. Uh, this is in, in one area to to build jobs is to invest, but uh, but bank loans have become difficult for particularly the small sector, small small and medium sector to get because thanks to many loans became non-performing. But transparent AI can actually do a much better job of identifying who's credit and who's not credit worthy, make it transparent. I think that will free up bank managers to open up the credit markets. Right now, I think our credit to GDP ratio is very small, one of the smallest in the world. And healthcare and education delivery. These are, uh, I think in urban centers, we're all well off, but when we go into rural, there are massive problems here and AI can play a role. And of course, uh, the, all these areas AI can help, but of course it's going to come with big issues of inequality and polarization. 
and uh, their AI can hurt. So we need uh, you know, uh, the issue that I mentioned before of watchdogs, inform public research to be able to mitigate it. But I think on, uh, on the whole, uh, AI will bring us un uh, great, great benefits to India. And uh, it's a, a technology which cannot be ignored, will not be ignored, and must not be ignored, but it must be guarded. It must, but we need safeguards and guardrails. So here is a slide which I wasn't planning, but I was advised by a very famous economist in India last night. I was talking to him saying, you should put this up. So this is something which I've been coming to India many, many times from 2017 to 2019. And this comes to the core technology. Of course, I'm talking about core AI technology, but uh, uh, so uh, uh, if you look at core high technology, mass markets, uh, manufacturing sectors like computing, telecom, AI systems, and related semiconductors, commercial jets, aircraft, patented pharmaceuticals, so these are called core high technology centers. They're mass market because everybody uses them. These sectors are the crown jewels of any country. The sector is extremely difficult to enter. And many countries which were in the center being, were dominantly being pushed out. In the United States, we were dominant in semiconductors. Now we are, we are no more dominant, we're being pushed out. We recently, the Congress passed a $100 billion chips bill to try and re reinforce uh, our to try to re-enter and get some leadership of semiconductors. So this requires huge R&D investments and very high skill sets. In fact, in sitting here in Silicon Valley, the problem is it doesn't seem to be money, it's really is skills, human skills, because the systems are so complex. We not only need brilliant people, we got to go, got, we'd have to go through to the top universities, and then they need decades of experience before they can actually build such systems. And the sector is also globally intertwined. No nation is self-sufficient. Even ubiquitous smartphone probably has at least hundreds of companies in their supply chains at the primary level, and they have additional companies. For example, a fabrication unit for a semiconductor chip, the supply chain is 12,000 companies spread all over the world. About half of them are in China, the rest of them in Europe, Japan, Taiwan, and the United States. The so US share of global core high technology sector is about 31%. We're still the dominant country in the world, but we are seeing a lot of competition from Asia. But India's share is really, really very, very negligible. We really haven't entered the sector. So I think uh, India must become and can become a 5% global uh, player, for at least 5% global market share participant in this tech sector It'll take us one or two decades because we're starting at the very bottom right now. And to achieve that, we need a, a clarity of vision, a lot of perseverance, and I think uh, truly, truly fundamental changes. And I, uh, all these words are not mine. They give Dr. Anil Karkorkar, former chairman of Atomic Energy Commission, and I wrote an op-ed on this issue. And uh, both of us and many of us in India share this view so India must join the high tech, high tech sector of the world. It's, uh, it's absolutely essential. So with that, uh, uh, let me end. Uh, so we all looked at AI, we'll see what it can do and it can do a lot. And uh, it has its dangers, but I think uh, informed society, institutions like India International Center can help in, in gathering our resources to make sure to mitigate the risks. But I think the important thing for India is that we still have a lot of poor people and 300 million and of some 150 million are really desperately poor. So you have to make sure when this revolution comes and it will come, it works for all our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Paul Raj. Uh, we have uh, from our, amongst our participants, a few questions. And uh, I would, uh, if you permit, uh, read out these questions. Uh, one participant who does not wish to be named has asked, how does application of digital technologies such as AI will help small and marginal farmers in India? 
Right. <clears throat> I think it's going to be, a, uh, uh, in the United States, uh, farming has got, already got automated, heavily automated, but still use human beings. But uh, uh, AI uh, and, you know, uh, only 1% of the United States uh, actually uh, work in farming, and yet we produce a lot of food. India, our productive levels are much smaller. We have much smaller farm plots. And, uh, and I think the, uh, the dangers of AI, of automation and agriculture right now is not great. So I'm, uh, you know, you, robotic farming, I think uh, may not happen so quickly. So, but the positives of AI are very positive, are great because like, like uh, uh, we can run you know, through satellites and through drones, uh, survey fields, look for moisture content, diseases, and these can be done at very low cost. So a farmer can get much more data about what's happening in the farms. So, and that can help him you know, use fertilizers, use water more efficiently. And these are not uh, very complicated things to do. So I feel uh, net net AI will be a big value uh, in farming. Our problem of course is if automation comes in, and I think, I hope it doesn't come in so quickly, uh, uh, job displacement may not be a problem. So I think AI will be a big positive for us. Uh, the second question, Professor Paul Raj, is, is AI being used significantly for VR and building metaverse? Well, <laughs> the, uh, you know, there's all kinds of concerns about uh, AI uh, you know, taking over the world and uh, you know, uh, becoming hidden global masters. I uh, uh, ultimately, you, pull, uh, you know, somebody, a colleague of mine at Stanford says to worry about AI taking over the universe, taking over the world, is like worrying about overpopulation on planet Mars, you know. There's no life there anyway today. The overpopulation is not going to happen. So, <laughs> sort of, uh, the long-term issues about uh, AI, those concerns may not be, maybe over, over, over bloated. But uh, uh, it's no question that there's going to be power asymmetry because we, as common citizens, don't have, will not be able to see what the governments and corporations can see, and that gives us power asymmetry. I think the way we defend ourselves, uh, our democratic norms, is to have. Uh, is to be able to have institutions and dialogue to you know make sure these things are open and visible to us. Thank you. Uh, uh, another question: uh, a Possible, what possible role can AI play in India's moon landing mission? I, I suspect <laughs> we are already using it, but uh, almost today, no. Uh, you know, particularly thing like moon landing is really remote robotics and i'm pretty sure isro is using some elements of ai there so i would say that uh, uh, it can play a lot um, but of course the ai is a long journey right now despite talking about uh, very complex ai systems uh, uh, enormously complex it's still a beginning of a long journey so uh, i'm sure in 30 years from now uh, uh, we can send in ro rovers to Moon and Mars, and they can do a lot more things they can do today. But uh, I'm sure it's already playing a role. Uh, then another participant says he wishes to thank you for your fascinating narration, and he wishes to have a copy of your presentation. We will supply him with one. He says that uh, though he's a retired diplomat, his professional training has been in physics and communication electronics. And his question is, can the AI machines also learn from each other? And there have been reports, if so, impact on human race and how these will self, how these self-learning machines be controlled by humans. Right. So that's a very good question. So of course, you know, when, when AI learns, it really it learns the model. And models are just a bunch of numbers in these uh, neural networks, for example. And uh, AI is typically uh, can exchange models. So if I learn how to, for example, understand Gujarati, 
uh, it can easily learn and send that around and other machines can use it. So these machines collaborate all the time, gives them more power. And, uh, and uh, so uh, the question is uh, uh, the power asymmetry between, I wouldn't say the machines have any power, they are essentially the power remains with those who control them, whether it's garments or corporations and so on and so forth. So, uh, uh, the, uh, the, and that comes with dangers. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, machines themselves are completely dumb. All they do is we give them data they learn. So there's nothing, you know, nothing uh, very mysterious about what they're doing. So it's really is uh, 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 the way we deal with that is uh, transparency, openness, democracy. Thank you. Uh, there is another question: Can AI identify itself? that news is fake or not to avoid polarization of population? Fake right. or not to avoid? Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the thing is that social media uses AI to drive engagement. Uh, the more eyeballs social media attract, the more money they get through ad revenues. And unfortunately for human beings are such that we are attracted by uh, things like uh, you know, bandwagon. By we, we tend to gather, uh, tend to go with other people that who think like us. So this, uh, or we have this uh, uh, the various kinds of biases, including uh, the herd mentality or confirmation bias. So the social media and through AI models knows a lot about us, and then they try and attract us by recommending things that they know by, um, by modeling us individually what we would like to see. And that creates polarization. Now the question is, uh, can we regulate that? Uh, certainly in the United States, the Congress has tried, but it's failed because these industries are very powerful. They're in the money, they are extremely wealthy. They can hire very expensive lobbyists. So US, I think we have not been successful. I think India can be more successful, I think, in building guardrails. So I'm confident India, uh, if we do our, do our job right, can do a better job of preventing polarization. It's only done by, not only done by social media, it's also done by political entities, which are for their own goals. So ultimately, I think it's watchdogs and a democratic process, an inclusive process that will help us. Thank you. There's one observation, it's not a question. Uh, one participant observed that uh, the slide that you slip, skipped might be useful for the audience because people need to go beyond aggregates. Yes, I think it's axiomatic. And uh, my own uh, reaction or response was to Paul Rogers that the, 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 the various uh, uh, points that were listed in the last slide you showed us is uh, particularly, I think, important for uh, the Indian situation, the political, societal, the economic situation. Uh, we have to be sensitive, but yet not uh, give up the ambition of being on the world scene. Uh, you talked about the core uh, tech sector, and I see no reason uh, why, uh, why we can't do much better than we are doing today. Then there is uh, another question, well, you've spoken about it. He's talking about eradication of poverty in India and when it's going to displace unskilled jobs. I think you've already spoken about this. Um, then there is another question. Uh, keeping the present generation in mind, can you please tell us which fields are suggestible to improve their, improve their career in AI? Please tell us which fields are suggestible to improve their career in AI? Right. Um, all good questions. You know, uh, I think uh, if you look at the industrial revolutions, uh, yeah, uh, mass production, uh, yeah, communi telecom, communications have created a lot of jobs. AI will create lots of jobs too. And uh, I think uh, uh, yeah, well, for, for many more years to come, we will be importing all the core technology because we don't have the capability and we need to focus on that. 
But uh, this, despite the fact that we import this, we have technology, for example, now in 4G or in Wi-Fi, we have built very successful networks in our country. In fact, one of the lowest cost networks in the world is in India. So uh, I think applying AI, uh, uh, using AI technologies to improve bank loan performance or to improve you know, fertilizers, all those can be built. There's plenty of jobs for us in building applications in AI. And uh, so uh, how do we learn about them? Well, I think uh, certainly in college, but but uh, there's, uh, there, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of training institutes, AI, and it's not that difficult, in fact, because ultimately we want to learn, if you want to do things like I do in wireless, those are very, very complex mathematics, and that's not easy to enter. I mean, we have some people, we have few in India who do that, but but AI, it's all about just providing data, properly labeled and integral data, and these machines learn on their own. So actually, once you have the machine, building applications is not difficult. It's going to open up a lot of jobs and a lot of positives. So I think uh, you'll find that all this happens uh, for the good of our people. Well, the two, two uh, observations, stroke questions, possibilities of inclusion of AI and ML in defense technologies, AI applications for enhancing maritime security, and so on. You yourself, Professor Paul Raj, have made uh, some very fundamental foundational contributions to naval sonars, to the LCA project, and so on. So I, I don't think I will um, pressure you to list all these things. These are um, illustrative uh, and the area is very large and maritime or defense. Defense has so many areas of uh, functioning and concern, platforms, equipment, systems. And I think uh, AI and tech digital technologies have vast scope. Uh, can, can blockchains be of help in promoting transparency of AI? Yeah, let me first address your first question, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Wara, uh, I mean, I uh, I have avoided defense uh, and national security, intelligence. Uh, that is where AI is all now mainly present. Uh, it's huge, absolutely huge. And uh, here in the U.S., we have square miles of of uh, of uh, of uh, buildings with computers inside them, uh, doing a lot of AI in these areas. So yeah, uh, it's not my domain to to touch on those issues. Uh, obviously, India must be paying attention to them. Now, to, uh, uh, to come back to, and uh, likewise, uh, whether it's the Navy, Air Force, or uh, more importantly, intelligence. I mean, intelligence gathering uh, is so important for national security, which AI is heavily used there. The, with respect to your question about blockchain, blockchain is an interesting idea, and uh, I know it is kind of used in Bitcoins and things like that, but it has many more applications in uh, in in commerce, uh, and uh, and uh, so it's a AI is a, is a different concept. Blockchain is really is like an open public database which is verifiable. So uh, uh, therefore, uh, the idea core idea of blockchain is that uh, data uh, or, or transactions are visible to everybody, and they can't be they're immutable. You can't reverse them. So it actually reduces fraud. Uh, but the problem with blockchain is that it uses a whole lot of computing power. And it, right now it is kind of dominant in uh, cryptocurrencies and it's very controversial, but it has uh, much more uh, mundane and important applications. It's a little different from AI, but uh, it's an area that, that India, I think, uh, can build. It's still very early in, in, the, in, the, in, in its uh, Evolvement. Thank you very much. And the one question which is uh, expressing a certain apprehension: uh, Would uh, AI, uh, in the long run, reduce and gradually finish creative thinking of human beings? I, you know, my opinion is that, uh, as I mentioned, out how a three-year-old child uh, totally outperforms these massive square miles of computers. And uh, so uh, human intelligence is not well understood. It has dimensions that these machines, uh, some level are pretty dumb. 
uh, so I don't think uh, uh, that's a very long way and it may never happen. So I wouldn't worry about, they're not in our lifetime. So don't worry about it. So with this uh, last observation, uh, Professor Paul Raj, I would not uh, pressure you to continue <laughs> further. We have come to the end of our envisaged time for this program. Um, there are questions which we will um, type out and uh, I will, if you kindly permit, have them sent on to you. So if some of these you feel um, could be answered in certain form, and then we can pass them on to the questioners. But I will not take more time of decision today. So with these words, Professor Paul Raj, let me once again uh, uh, thank you most warmly with great gratitude and that you have taken time off to speak to us for the second time in uh, a few uh, short span. And you've spoken to us in very simple terms of what the problems are, what lies ahead. And I, I but despite all this intelligence sector, defense sector, about which I myself would not like to speak very much, and the surveillance sector was for that matter, which has been in the news recently. Uh, I, I totally endorse your observation that, uh, which you said just now, that if uh, we should move towards at least 5% share in the pie uh, worldwide, uh, in the uh, high-tech uh, core sector, because that would be enormous uh, injection into our uh, GDP, our wealth, accumulation, poverty alleviation, and all the funding of the various uh, uh, poverty removal schemes, reducing seduction schemes, which are uh, ongoing even as of now. And there is, uh, needless to say, a paucity of funds uh, available to the states, paucity of funds available to the union government, but still a great deal of attention is being paid to, to and uh, my own perception is that if what you said earlier, that if uh, this knowledge is used uh, uh, with a certain balance, a certain prioritization, and in those sectors uh, where the, the, uh, there will be very little or uh, none uh, of uh, labor displacement and the uh, gains, accruals are significant, and those could be plowed back in the other sectors to upgrade them technologically and so on. But that, that is the issues of governance and issues of policy, which I'm sure are engaging the minds of uh, people who are responsible for setting up the policies. So once again, the President Paul Raj, our grateful thanks to you. And we look forward to requesting you again in the coming time, especially when you are a time when you visit India, then we would like a physical fixture at the India International Center. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Vora. Thank you. It was a great, great honor and uh, really enjoyed today's interaction. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Also to Ambassador Sham Saran and Mr. Sivas. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, much uh, Professor Paul Rajiv. He's been very, very kind to accept our invitation. We really appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.